city of the mind is so naked that we must cover it with our bodies, protect it with the walls of our skulls. And even these walls are not enough protection. For the barriers against the world may remain solid, and the mind within still may crumble. Unlike other cities, when the city of the mind is destroyed, it can only be rebuilt out of its own rubble. Not George. Oh, yeah. George is in the next room. Good morning, Fred. That's not my name. John Smith? No, no, no. Hey, hey. Oh, what do you want me to call you? Hey, it's your name. Like it's your name. You don't remember, do you? You don't remember your name. Huh? I remember. Let me think. I remember. Tom, Bill, Charlie, and Harry. Huh? Well, I'll call you whatever you want. You just tell me. Let me think. Two sixty-two. You call that a name? That's a number on your room. 262. All right, 262. Pick up the papers. Then we go outside in the yard for some exercise. You've got practically no wall space left here. Maybe I ought to stop bringing your paper. The ceiling. What are you going to paint up there? Sky. How are you going to paint a blue sky with a black shoe? What, do you think I'm going to bring you a blue shoe? We dream in black and white. All right, 262, outside. It's exercise day. OK, exercise. All out for exercise. Get off your seat and get out there for exercise. Exercise, period. Come on, move. <laughs> supposed to be here. Do you know what my name is? 
Now, do you want me to have to call Mr. Fitch? Do you happen to know if my name is Albert Blakely? I asked you a very important question. All right. I warned you. going to the police. He can kill someone. Possibly. You are tending to that man's head. When he returns, we will be more careful with him. When he returns? Where do you think he's going to go? He's been just in that one room for 20 years. There's no one in the whole world outside he can turn to. He has no money, he has no friends, he has no existence. He doesn't even know his own name. And if he remembered, what do you think you would say if someone walked up to you and said, I am Albert Blakely? Don't you think you ought to call a sponsor? No, he pays me $2,000 a month to be relieved of responsibility. He deserves the right to rest easily for that amount of money. See? circuit, just the auction part. We tie in with uh, Chicago and the West Coast. They see us on their monitors, we see them. Everybody bids at the same time. That sounds complicated and expensive. Why not? They're gonna sell a couple of million dollars worth of painting. Mr. Darrington? Yes? I'm Detective Flint. It's my partner, Detective Vaccaro. We were sent over to cover the auction. Oh, yes. Uh... Well, I don't know what you gentlemen are going to do. I don't know what I can do for you. I, I told the commissioner I have guards of my own. Well, the commissioner feels you're entitled to a little free public protection. The insurance company feels the same way. Yes, I understand. Believe me, I, I don't mean to be a rude gentleman, but I, I've got a thousand things here to do. Look, any of the guards will answer any of your questions. Fine. Uh, Henry, uh, that picture goes on the west wall. Oh, uh, where can we get a floor plan of the building showing the entrances and exits? See Bill Franz. Who's Bill Franz? Don't you know Bill Franz? No. It's the man with the plan. Oh. I'll try again in a minute, Carl. She'll be down in just a minute. As often as I look at him, 
No matter how many times I try to find some kind of relationship between us, there's just nothing. How am I supposed to tell him about a man I don't even know? I feel as cold toward him as he must have felt when he abandoned us. No, no, no. He didn't abandon you, Beth. He died. Yes, afterwards. Whatever kind of a father he was, out of his genius, you have an estate worth several million dollars. I want you to talk to the newspaper men. Paintings are funny things, Beth. Part of their value lies in the legend that surrounds them. Then you tell them the legend, Carl, for the hundred and the hundredth time. You knew him. You breathed the same air. You tell him the legend, Carl, and leave me alone. Has to be you. Everybody likes to come a little closer to genius. I'm only his cousin. That's not close enough. You're flesh of his flesh. I said in a minute. I see you a minute, Carl. I want to show you something. Elizabeth, the longer you wait, the harder it gets. You can leave any time you want to. All right, how about that light?
Listen, do you always give your girls two full hours to get dressed for a formal date? What's the matter? I had to tip my hairdresser at 250. It'd take me out of turn. It was worth it. Yeah, worth every cent of it. If you say it was worth it, then I guess so. Do you know what happened to me? What? It took four phone calls to convince Parker that I'd be less conspicuous with this attire if I had a very beautiful girl on my arm. Hello there. <laughs> You're a beaut, aren't you? Sir, but this is my invitation only. Do you know Albert Blakely? If you saw him, would you recognize him? Why, well, he's been dead for 20 years. Are you sure? Yes, why? What's the matter? Well, I was looking for him, that's all. Well, he's been dead for 20 years, sir. two hours with a 250 tip to a hairdresser? Five to the wardrobe woman, and I turn into a pumpkin if I don't get it back before curtain time. I see. Do you know I happen to love pumpkin pie? <laughs> Keep your mind on art. <laughs> Listen, do you think somebody's really going to steal a painting? Of course. Everybody here. Honey, why do you think people come to auction? Don't stand in the doorway, Pop. You're going to get run over. Psst. Listen, I bet you five cents he's the only real millionaire in the whole house. No bet. I think you're right. Please, ladies and gentlemen, here in New York, out there in Chicago and Los Angeles and San Francisco, we're about to begin. My attorney advises me that I should inform you you may be picked up by the television cameras at any time, all of this is not a public telecast. The lines linking our four cities together are privately leased and are represented by the TV monitors, which you'll see on the wall to my right here. Despite the fact that the presence of television makes this auction unique in the history of art, the rules of auction will nevertheless prevail, and all sales will be final and binding. My friends, we're gathered together this afternoon in part to pay homage to a great and tragic artist, the late Albert Blakely. I've asked Albert Blakely's cousin to speak to us for a few moments. Mr. Blakely, please. When Albert died 20 years ago, his works were hardly known. 20 years made him famous. Albert Blakely is now a famous name. And yet, the man himself remains unknown even to me. I remember when we were 15, Albert was already painting quite seriously. 
We used to laugh at him for the intensity with which he worked. We were children. He was not. Now that we are grown and I look at the work of this man, I realize that in some strange way, he, who was so mature in his early perceptions, has retained that simplicity, that naivete of childhood, and we have lost it. I suppose that's what makes a Blakely canvas valuable. It bears a truth, a view of the world which we have lost and which we can only return to through the genius of a Blakely. Now, he was, he was a master draftsman and a miraculous technician and colorist, but I suspect that these things are only important because they enable the painting to carry a stronger communication. It is the content of this pic... Will the gentleman looking at the painting please sit down? Carl, this painting is a fraud. <laughs> we'll have to destroy it, Carl. It's a fraud. I don't know any name but the name I gave. But, mister, everybody has a name. Yes, 262. Now, look, I told you before, that's not a name. That's not enough for us to go on. 262. Do you think I might be Albert Blakely? You really don't know, do you? I, I get confused. I, I don't know whether that's somebody I'm looking for or whether it's me. I keep asking people to help me. Nobody knows. He's been dead for 20 years. Does that help? I think I know this man. Do you know who he is? All right, now. I want you to sit down here in this chair. That's it. May I use that pencil? You just smashed up a hundred thousand buck picture without asking anybody. Now you're asking permission to use a nickel lead pencil? Just for letters. Did you notice the frames on those pictures downstairs? Yeah. Beautiful framing. Oh, I hope I didn't damage the frame on that picture. So, did you get anything out of him? I can't even find out his name, Mike. Did he say why he went after the painting? No, he didn't. I don't think he really knows why. Oh, he said he was sorry if he hurt the frame. <laughs> you can get a new frame for $150. I'd like to see anyone replace this picture for any amount of money. He has to be out of his head. Well, I guess he could be faking. But I doubt it, Mike. I don't think he knows which end is up. They'll find that out at Bellevue. You gentlemen still feel the same about not pressing charges? It's a moot point, isn't it, if the man is insane? I may bring it up again after I get a psychiatric report. Send him down for observation. Right. Gave me a present. Says he likes me. Detective Flynn, 65th Precinct. Put me through to the ambulance service, please. I didn't lose his face. He hasn't had one for a long time. Mm -hmm. Oh, please keep it. Thank you. 
Hello, operator, what's holding it up? I'm trying to get through to the ambulance service. Why did you say, Carl, this picture is a fraud? Why did you call him Carl? Things slip in and out of my mind. Please ask me again. Why did you call him by his first name? We knew each other when we were children. Somebody named Carl. Do you know him? This is my father. I thought you looked like him. Hello. Ambulance service. This is Detective Flint, 65th Precinct. I'm at the Darrington Art Gallery on Waverly Place. We have a prisoner here we'd like you to pick up for observation. Yeah. Right, thanks. Are you taking me to a hospital? Yes. Good. There are too many questions here. see any point in getting hysterical about the situation. You were in far more trouble when the police had him. The fact that he's escaped is to your advantage. I'm trying to get some insight into what he might do next. Why would you expect me to know? Now look, Crody, you've had him up there for 20 years. You must have some idea how he thinks. My dear Mr. Blakely, you paid me for custodial service, not therapy. I don't think I've seen your cousin twice in the entire time he was under my care. It is possible that he may want to return here. It is also possible that he may want to kill you, in which case he will try. I suggest that you go to the police for protection. That's the only advice I'm able to give you at the present time. Mm. Look, Crody, if things go badly, just remember that you're involved. Am I? Suppose you try to find any records here. Suppose you try to find somebody here who remembers such a man. Don't threaten. Darrington! Stop it! What are you doing? We've got to get rid of every one of these forgeries. They're not forgeries, they're restoring. Those are paintings he had half finished, and Soren finished them for him in Albert style. They're restorings, that's all. We've got to get rid of every last trace of them. I've got ten years' work in those paintings. Darrington, there's no telling how much money those paintings are worth. Half a million, a million. They're worth two cents if he says that's what they're worth. Don't you understand? <laughs> Now, don't panic! You saw him, there's no mind there, no consciousness of self. How can he prove who he is if we stand together against him? It's, it's not worth the risk. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! There's me in there! There's as much me in there as there is him! It's got to be destroyed! It's got to be destroyed! You understand?
Operator, get me the police. I want to report a murder. Keep your eyes on where you're driving. I think it's odd that the guy wipes his prints off and made a weapon but leaves a note saying he did it. How do I know what a maniac's gonna do? Mike, he's not gonna wipe his prints off the murder weapon. Look, he leaves a note saying he did it and he signs it. Okay, I buy that. Sure he signs it. Do you know why? Because he thinks he's justified and he wants the rest of the world to see it. That's why he's sick. But he's not gonna wipe his prints off the weapon. What is this, a Chinese water torture? This is the 40th time you mentioned prints. Why is it that the auction? He went after the painting and not the man. Why was it he slugged the resident at Bellevue? You know, you could wear the floor out walking back and forth like that. You know, I don't get your point either, Adam. Adam? I know you a long time. You've got something on your mind, you're not saying it. This thing you've got on your mind is so screwy that you blow your top every time I get near it. If you got a hunch, tell me. But let's stop the rhubarb! All right. Now, no single detail really means anything. This whole bloody picture, it stinks. Look, we get a guy for acting screwy at the art gallery. Then we send him off to Bellevue for observation. But before they have a time to examine him, he escapes. Now, while he's on the loose, a murder happens at the art gallery. Now, who's the prime suspect? Now, here's some loose ends that bother me. First of all, we've never proven yet, one way or another, sane or insane, that when the guy said the painting was a fraud, it was or it wasn't. There was no time. Granted, granted. But let's just suppose now for a minute that he was telling the truth, that the painting is a fraud, and it could be proved. Wouldn't that be reason enough for somebody to want to get rid of him, to pin a murder on him? And here's another thing. When we were questioning him, we couldn't even get a name out of the guy. And not because he was trying to give us a hard time. He just didn't know. Frank and I, we asked him. He really didn't know, Mike. That's right. And I believed him. And at that time, he didn't claim to be Albert Blakely then. But four or five hours later, I'm supposed to believe that he signed a note confessing to murder by using that name? Oh, come on, Mike. Well, maybe he was trying it out for size. You don't reach me, Adam. Mike, I'm going to level with you. Aha! Uh -huh. Now we're getting to the heart of the matter. Go. When we were questioning him a half hour after he destroyed that painting, I sat him down at Darrington's desk. Now, I didn't pay any attention to this at first, but Frank here, he, he noticed it and made a point of it. Do you know what he did? He asked us permission to pick up and use a five-cent lead pencil. Now, 
Now, Mike, I think that any man who has to ask permission to pick up and use a pencil is a man who must have spent an awful long time in a prison or an institution. Well, look, none of us here, no matter how polite we're trying to be, is going to ask permission to pick up and use a pencil. I think the man spent a long time in an institution, and I think the man is Albert Blakely. Now, go ahead. Have me committed for observation. Adam, you stood next to me less than an hour ago when I asked Carl Blakely if this guy wasn't his cousin. And he pulled the death certificate out of his pocket and showed it to us. Yeah, he pulled it out of his pocket. He just happened to have it in his pocket. Did you see that death certificate? I saw it. The name Albert Blakely was on it, wasn't it? Yeah. And the date of death was 1940? Yes, and it could very easily have been forged. Why would you suppose that? It doesn't make sense to me that a famous painter would be sorted away in an institution while everyone thinks he's dead. That's the point. The man was not a famous painter 20 years ago. Frank, did you see the biography on that brochure that the art gallery put out for the auction? Mike, this man never owned a car, so he never had a driver's license. He never had a job, so he never had a social security card. He never made 600 bucks a year in his life, therefore he never filed for an income tax return. The man lived in an isolated house. His wife went out and did all the shopping. His own neighbors didn't even remember what he looked like. He didn't even bring his own paintings to the art gallery. He used to bring them to his cousin, Carl. Then he'd go home and paint some more. Mike, the man was practically invisible. It would have been the most simple thing on earth for anybody to blot him out with the tip of their little finger. If he was in, he had to get out. And we have no report of a loony escapee that fits this guy's description. All right. Let's go along with your premise. A famous artist is sorted away in an institution for nearly 20 years, right? He escapes. When he gets out, he finds that his paintings are being sold. But he finds that the loot for those paintings is going into someone else's pocket. Right. Well, did you ever see a cleaner blueprint for homicide? Well, either way, we've got to find him, don't we? Every other policeman and detective in New York is looking for this man. Adam, I don't see how I can find an exemption for you. Let's just take the very smallest possibility that this man is a victim and not the killer, huh? Right now, the whole force is on the lookout for a homicidal killer. If he makes one crazy move, they're gonna shoot him. Mike, at least give him this much of a break. Reword your all points bulletin so that everybody's not out there looking for the man with one hand on their gun butts. Listen here, Detective Flint. This is the New York Police Department, not a bunch of trigger-happy kids. This man knocked a physician down in the hospital and almost fractured his skull. I'm giving you five more minutes to sulk in. And you either join the New York Police Department, or I suspend you for a month, find you six weeks' pay, and bust you back into uniform and a beat. I signed the death certificate in this case. Blakely Albert, occupation painter, admitted March 24, 1940, discharged September 3, 1940. Cause of termination of state, death from pulmonary pneumonia, certifying medical doctor Wolfgang Crody. The body was claimed by a relative, Carl Blakely, and it was, I dare say, properly disposed of. Well, that's it, Detective Flint. Doctor, have you had any prisoner escapes in the last week or ten days? No, that's a pretty rare occurrence here, an escape. We haven't had more than uh, three in 30 years. Oh. How about discharges? Any of those lately? 
We are a custodial hospital, Detective Flint. We have a very small number of dischargees, mostly transfers to other hospitals, or, of course, patients die. I sure wish I had some explanation for these sketches. Well, our patients aren't allowed outside. It wouldn't be likely that they would ever even see this particular view of the hospital, so... Oh, I would suggest that uh, whoever did this sketch had nothing whatsoever to do with this hospital. Uh-huh. Okay, Doctor. Thank you very much for your courtesy. I'll walk down with you to the gate. We have very few visitors. It is a welcome interruption. Fine, thank you. Doctor, thank you very much for your cooperation, anyway. All right, Doctor, now you can stop lying. I got that sketch at 4.30 last Saturday afternoon. Now, you tell me whoever did that sketch wasn't in this hospital of yours. Well, go ahead, doctor. You tell me that. I want to hear you tell me that. Shut the door. Don't, don't lock the door. Please go away. I have to go out. I, I remembered something. After you asked me about Carl, I'm, I'm looking for the doll's face. I don't face. want to talk to you. Don't you understand? Not the little girl's I... face. The doll's face. <laughs> don't you understand? I just want to show you something. Just to show you something. said because there's no face on it she has no eyes to see with she has no mouth to smile with smile was that it wait here will you wait here yeah. I 
I know. I know, I know who I am. I know everything. My name is Albert Blakely. I know. <laughs> Elizabeth. We're strangers. I didn't even know you. I didn't even ask you into my house. <laughs> Lieutenant Parker speaking. Oh, Mike, this is Anna. Where are you? Well, you're through around here. Mike, will you listen? When I get through charging you with negligence, irresponsibility. Mike, I've got something. Conduct on becoming a police officer. Willful disobedience to a specific order from a superior. Mike, will you shut up a minute? What? Look, even a guy in the electric chair is entitled to a final word. I'm up here at Gillian Sanitarium where Blakely was kept, and Blakely's still alive. Now, will you listen to me? Because unless I'm mistaken, Blakely's going to be killed for the second time. All right. Shoot. During the night gallery. I'm going to destroy you, Carl. I remember you, Carl. You buried me alive. Not so much for what you did to me, Carl. What you did to Elizabeth. I took your paintings and I made them famous. I took your daughter and I made her rich. I took your worthless life and I made it into a legend of value. What were you? Mindless, shapeless, unable to paint, useless. You put my name on paintings that are not mine! These? Do you know what you were? I walked into your house and your daughter was howling like a little wild animal. Your wife was hysterical. And you stood there laughing with your hand in the burning stove, laughing. You know what you said? You said, I'll show them. I burn the hand that paints for them. I gave them beauty and they didn't want it. With your hand in the fire, burning. You didn't have a glass of milk in the house for your child to drink. We took you away, shapeless, mindless, useless. You did this to yourself, not I. I'm going to destroy you, Carl. <laughs> maniac was trying to kill us. Was he, Mr. Blakely? I saw somebody trying to put a knife on him. I don't know who did what to whom, but I'm certainly going to find out. My daughter says I'm a famous man. People come from all over the world to see my pictures. I didn't want them to see Carl. I wanted him to be invisible, to blot him out. As he blotted me out, I've taken away his face from the world. Eight million stories in the naked city. This has been one of them. Gems Film Presentation from Columbia Pictures, produced by Herbert B. Leonard.